Hi, this is Ashley. And this is Kristen. And this is A Thousand Miles of True Crime. Wow, it's been almost two months, Kristen. Can you believe it? We're finally back. I know. It's been a refreshing break, but I'm really excited to be back. I know you are too. Yeah. Yes. I have been so excited all week about recording and I'm very excited. We have a very special guest with us here today, Megan. We've got Megan from the Nerd Cantina. I want to say hello, hi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Megan, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your podcast. Yeah. So I am a contributor to the Nerd Cantina. It's a website and also a podcast. What I do, my contribution is I write book reviews and of advanced copies. And then I also get opportunities to interview authors about their work. And those episodes are called Cantina Conversations. And, you know, it's super fun. I'm a huge bookworm. I'm going to read books anyway. So it's been really cool to kind of dig a little deeper into their brains, like a little mini book club with the author themselves. And, you know, I, I learned a lot. And like I said, I'm a big dork, so I, I enjoy it. But yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to, I listen to you guys like almost every episode I've like keeping up, I'm, pre- I'm keeping up pretty well. So I'm excited to have the chance to chat with you guys today. Well, We, again, we appreciate you being here. And not only do we love each other's podcasts, we really are friends. We met back in, I think, what, like 2007 at Northern Illinois University? Yeah. Yeah. The good old DeKalb. (laughs) Good old, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So if you're not from Illinois, it's a wonderful cornfield. And then there's like a university (laughs) in the middle of it. But I mean, we were having a really good time there. And I wanted you to come onto this episode because of who we're going to be covering. So we're going to actually cover the Northern Illinois University shooting. So specifically Stephen Kazmiersik. And uh, so when this is dropping, so when if you guys are listening the day it released, then happy Valentine's Day. On top of that, it's the unfortunate 15th anniversary of the shooting. And it's also Megan's birthday. So happy, happy birthday, Megan. Happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) So spoiler alert, it was actually Megan's 21st birthday, the day this happened. So definitely we'll get to dig into a little of that because I'm guessing that was an interesting memory to add to your birthday. Yeah, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> so it really starts out with Stephen Kazmierskik being born on August 26, 1980. And this was in Elk Grove Village, Illinois. And there was really, there was a question sort of from the beginning over whether his mom had was suffering from mental illness. She had a, a lot of anxiety. She suffered from some depression and clear bouts of insomnia where she just was not sleeping at all. And she was always really worried about Steven. She didn't want him going outside. She didn't really have him playing with friends or anything like that. He had to stay at home and they would read the Bible pretty regularly. She was very religious. And then the other thing that they would do almost religiously was watch scary movies. They both just love scary movies. So they would cover the windows on Saturdays and stay in all day, just watching scary movie after scary movie. But this kind of made him, you know, sort of antisocial, not getting to go out and play with other kids his own age. Later, she would sort of loosen up. She would, you know, go back to work. She would be a secretary. His dad was a mailman. And by all accounts, I mean, it was a pretty average household. His grades were pretty average too there I found these accounts from like his third grade teacher that was sort of like uh it's nothing special but he's not the worst kid in the class either there's just nothing that notable about him but he sort of loosened up and started to flourish a little more in junior high he played the tanner sax in the school band and this is where he would finally start to meet some people meet some friends And he starts hanging out with this guy, Adam. So Adam has some fun stories about his friend, Steven. So he recounts that they would go over to his house and he would pick his pug up, like his dog, by his hind legs and throw him against the wall as hard as he could. And then just laugh about it. Yeah. And it's red flag number one right there, to be honest. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a huge, huge red flag. You gotta kind of wonder why Adam kept going back, but I think it was, he thought this was like, oh, oh like my friend's just kind of weird. There's more red flags because he also recounts that he was like obsessed with pellet guns and just shoot, trying to shoot him constantly. Like the second he got home, he'd grab his, his gun. And then he learned how to create a Drano bomb in the eighth grade. So he's hanging out with this kid, Pete, Rachowski and he taught uh not only Steve but like a bunch of these kids how to make a Drano bomb and Steve and this guy Joe think we're not just gonna make a Drano bomb we're gonna go set this thing off and they find this house that's dark and they set it off there really it's like more successful than they were planning it was super loud uh they go running I think they really enjoyed themselves but five days later Pete's mom finds all these ingredients to make this Drano bomb and just totally busts him. She's furious. She gathers up all the stuff and she takes him to the police station. She was not playing and they're interrogating him. Like they know this bomb went off. They know somebody set this off and he's freaking out. And he finally rats out his friends and he says like, Hey, that was not me. That was Steve and Joe. They go and they get Steve, they get Joe. And right away, the cops are like, oh, this is going to be easy because Steve looks terrified. He's ready to pee in his pants. They're like, like we're going to just scare the crap out of this kid. He's never going to do this again. They literally put it in the report. This kid is so remorseful. Like they're practically like patting themselves on the back. We scared this kid straight. And he was so freaked out that he just starts rattling off the names of like every kid that was there and learned how to make this Drano bomb. So then all of these cops show up to all of these kids' houses and tell their parents, you know, they can't arrest them, but they're like, just, you know, your kid knows how to make this bomb. Don't buy him any Drano and stuff. So, (laughs) you know, this is eighth grade or whatever. Obviously he's not Mr. Popular in school now. He just ratted out half the class. And I think it's, It's just sort of, again, it's more challenging for him. At this point, he decides to sort of become a goth kid and he starts wearing all black. He also is having some like issues with, even with his close friends that he still had because he got caught talking behind their backs and stuff. So he, he was just struggling, but he starts to find himself again as this goth kid and hanging out with this goth group. And you know how, you know, they're kind of stereotyped as being like the outcasts already, but Steve was the outcast in the outcast group. Like even all the goth kids were like, I mean, I guess you can hang around, but you're you're kind of weird. Somehow though, like to everybody's surprise, he manages to land this girlfriend and like everybody says she looks like Liv Taylor. I think even he was shocked. Like he was like, I don't know, I should play the lottery. So he's like really happy for six months. Everything's going good. And then she dumps him and tells everybody that it's all because he has a small dick and can't satisfy her. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think that that was just probably hard to hear. How old old was this? This is like early, early on in high school. So freshman, sophomore. like peak damage at that peak point. Damage. Yeah. Oh Your reputation gosh. is all you have at that point. And it's like, <sighs> yeah. And the Liv Taylor of your school <laughs> is telling everybody. So he kind of gets, he seems to get like obsessed with sex. Now he just wants it. I don't know if it's, I have to prove myself. I have to prove that uh, I'm, I can do this. He even later in life will talk about how he's, he's very good with his, tongue he used to play the saxophone like you know this is this just becomes a theme in his life and so he is he's like basically willing to hook up with anybody like he won't admit it to his friends but he's like even hooking up with guys and then this is like something that will happen like throughout life and then he kind of gets upset later in life because he realizes he's not gay he's literally just doing it because he wants to hook up with people it's it's just hard I think it's hard for us to understand like it's hard for him to understand he's trying to figure out what's going on He's doing all this. He's still just kind of like chugging along. But all of a sudden, he gets notably a lot more anxious. He's acting odd. He's really antisocial all of a sudden. And he decides that he's going to kill himself. 
So he starts selling all, he sold all his stuff, like his guitars, like almost everything he had. And on December 14th, 1996, he overdoses on Tylenol. He ends up calling his, at that time, on and off girlfriend, Beth King. And he like admits, like, I think I messed up. I took all these pills. And so she calls his parents and they instantly take him to the hospital. They check him into Rush University Medical Center. And he's, he's there for a whole week. But he's still really anxious. Even when he's leaving, he feels like he's still really depressed and he's completely unable to sleep. And now he's, they, they put him on a ton of meds and he's having like a bunch of side effects from him. He was always this pretty skinny guy. And all of a sudden, in the matter of months, he's ballooned to 300 pounds. It's a very notable noticeable difference. And like that's gonna impact your life. And he's in high school. So that's definitely gonna be hard for him to handle. So again, April 13th, you know, what is that? Like a, a few months later, he overdoses on 40 Ambien and he slits his wrist. So he gets hospitalized again. He's at rush. Then on November 4th, he takes 50 depicotes and then so like the entire bottle and he just goes to sleep and he's actually he's shocked like he's actually shocked when he wakes up in the, the next morning and he's just sort of like oh, like what do I gotta do here and he gets he's like I guess I'm just gonna get ready he goes to school but he's sitting in his first period of class and his teacher's like uh like what is what's wrong with you like you need go to the nurse right now and of course the nurse is like, uh, no, you, you need to go to the hospital. So they call an ambulance and he ends up in Alexia Brothers for only three days at that point. He goes, so he gets out and then he goes back again two months later, the same thing. And then he, he gets out and he goes back again from February 7th to the 11th. Just a couple of things here. Can we talk about how he's not just taking like a few pills? He's also not like calling someone immediately after he's doing this. It, it seems to be like these are more than just like cries for help. Like he's really trying to, dare I say, get the job done. Yeah, because that's definitely excessive. And he's definitely, it was almost like he took enough, like f to be foolproof. And yeah. It didn't work. And that's crazy. How does he attempt so many times within the span of like what a year? And the mo like he's just hospitalized for a few days and then he gets let let out and there's so there was like no real like uh, further intervention than that. It's that's crazy. I, I under I guess it's easy for us to say now, like 15 years later, but it's like that seems like like something there was there was a few missed opportunities there i can say too like i agree but i also feel like as a parent when your child is is put into they're admitted for attempting suicide your fear is like you want them out of there you know you mm. don't want them labeled as that or whatever and then too you know i'm sure being in a place like that he wanted out so mm. it's like whatever whatever i have to do to assume that i'm normal and that everything is fine just let me out of here even though i'm really not so i don't know maybe that had something to do with it and it why could have been was I, more I, intervention yeah i could see that yeah maybe he was like freaked out and and then maybe i mean their parents were probably a little freaked out too yeah because like i totally understand like from a parent's point of view maybe they were kind of like walking on eggshells at after a certain point you know one of the things that kind of struck me too was like they, they didn't take over access to his medication he seemed to still just have all these bottles of medication laying around and like i know you can't lock up everything right the first time you did it used tylenol i just thought that was interesting that they were still it seemed like they were still trusting him with all of his medication and he was clearly using that as a, a weapon mm -hmm. several times so during this time in his, his visit in February, he, well, he had kind of confessed to his dad that his, remember his old friend, Pete, the Drano guy, that he was selling drugs and acid, some other stuff. Like we're not just talking about 
some weed or something. And so his dad gets really mad and goes to the police department. And I think at this point, his dad's maybe blaming these drugs on, you know what I mean? Like, this is the problem. It's not my son. It's Pete. Pete. And at first he doesn't have a lot of information, but I don't know how he's getting it out of Steve. He comes back with like a bunch more information and, you know, the cops are starting to take it seriously. During this time, again, he's back in and out of the hospital. Again, he tries to kill himself on the 12th. And this time he takes 120 doses of Depakote. I mean, and he's done this how many times at this point? Like, I feel like that's like yeah, nine or 10 times. It's a lot. And then you have to almost wonder how many times did he not go to the hospital? He gets out at that point and he's going to go back to work. He actually worked like he had a part-time job at the library. And he, so he goes back to work, but right around this time, Pete gets arrested and pretty quickly the rumor and, you know, is pretty clear how he got arrested and why the cops knew about him. So he corners Steve at the library and he tells him for less than an ounce, I could get people to take care of you. He is just, first of all, just not making friends. I don't think he should have ratted out Pete, but I did think it was like a little interesting. Like Pete ratted him out first. You know what I mean? (laughs) With the Drano bomb, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that Steve does clearly seem to be ratting a lot of people out though. Like he seems to be losing friends pretty quickly everywhere he goes. But he, he finally does graduate. And then his parents are honestly like, they're kind of, they're at their wits end. They don't know what to do with him. And it seems like they're, they are afraid for their son, clearly, for obvious reasons. But it also just seems like that especially his mom is afraid of his son. And there doesn't seem to be like any clear accounts where he's like overly threatening her or things like that. I mean, he does have these very extreme mood swings but I don't know to me it seemed like maybe she just somehow saw something in there and knew there was just something not quite right in her son but they managed to get him into the Mary Hill residence and this is this this great program it's more long term they're going to manage everything in his life basically including his medicine and he'll be constantly monitored So he should be getting better, right? He's getting constant therapy, everything. He's got a case manager, but he just seems to be getting more and more depressed. And he starts telling him that he actually has superpowers and that he could always read people's minds, but now it's just getting a lot stronger and he can't sort of block it out or manage it. So like, that's the real problem. And that he reads everybody's minds and he knows that everybody underestimates him, including like here at this facility. So that's like the real problem. So obviously they're trying to manage a lot of different situations going on with him. He's there for over right around a year and they, he seems to finally be, you know, stabilizing some they move him and they transition him into a single occupancy. He gets his own room. He does have to share a bathroom, but he starts to get more freedom. And with that, they get him a job at Walgreens and he loses that job. So then he gets a job at Jewel there for a couple of weeks, loses that job. Then they get him a job at Kmart and he's there for a couple of weeks and and so on and so on and so on I mean he gets these jobs and then he's like really argumentative he gets really paranoid and he like thinks people are out to get him and like everybody's talking about him and things like that at these jobs and he also just doesn't show up he and then like just flat out doesn't show up and I think like over you know now this other year they're just sort of like everybody's tired in this situation like it's he's tired he doesn't think that it's working this program's tired they that you're not taking it seriously you're not getting anything out of this you're just becoming sort of a waste of resources and he feels like he's just a zombie they've got him on so many drugs so he goes to visit his sister down at U of I, and I don't know if this is just like, hey, I'm getting to see all these people my age having a good time, and everyone's just really happy, and you know, their their parents aren't here, all those kind of things, the freedom. 
And he decides he needs to get off these meds. He needs to get out of this facility and he wants to go back to school. So obviously he co he goes back and he, he expresses his feelings to the city and they're kind of like, hey, like let's let's slow down a bit here. You can't really keep a job, you know, you, you're having trouble functioning as a person. Let's not jump into like, okay, the workload you can't handle, you know? And Steve's not like that. Like, he's like, nope, I'm going to college and just dives in and he signs up for all these classes at a community college. And he decides that he's just going to wean himself off of all of his medications. And he's flat out lying to the doctor. He's not just saying I'm taking my medicine and, and that kind of stuff. He's making up side effects and things like this to really keep him going. And um, so... Finally, after like five months, he like throws it in their face. He's like, well, tch, joke's on you. I haven't taken my medicine in five months. And without missing a beat, his caseworker points out to him immediately that, hey, man, you haven't been able to keep a job for more than three and a half weeks this entire, the, the entire five months. You dropped out of all of your classes. You're not sleeping at all. You really showed me. Like, <laughs> and at that point, it was like it was just made clear. You're we're we're all done, right? Like we're all done here. Like we we can just end this. They go ahead and they just discharge him from the program on September 5th, 2001. Wait, so how old is he when they discharge him? Uh so at this point, he's probably like 19, 20-ish. So, well, yeah, yeah. He's like 20 going on 21 because he was born in the 80s. I'm like, don't make me do math on the spot, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing else has worked, right? Like going to school hasn't worked. Trying to get a job hasn't worked. What else can we try? So he signs up for the army. Yikes. <sighs> Yeah, he just he just lies on the application, gets everything kind of expedited. He ends up at Fort Silk in Oklahoma and he does his basic training. He actually excels there, right? This is so structured. Like he has OCD and this is a very clean, organized place. He has severe anxiety, but you can't even overthink. Like you don't need to think here. Let the army think for you, you know? So like he has some pro like some problems with some people there. Big shocker, right? Overall, he's doing better than he ever has in his life. He is loving it. They're teaching him how to shoot guns. They're even doing all these trainings where they're like, not just teaching you like how to kill someone, but how to mentally handle that. And they're like, they're impressed that he's going through these exercises and not showing signs of trauma. You know, they're like, this is our guy. They're patting him on the, the back. And he's, he's passed basic training. He's scheduled to go to Fort Bliss in Texas. So he's excited. He's found his life. And it's not exactly clear what ha has happened. I don't know if like his full background check came in or if he did something, but all of a sudden, like they get very nervous with him and they start asking him a lot of questions about his psych background. They make him take a psych exam and Pretty quickly, within a couple of days, they actually take him to this medical center and they throw him in a psych ward because they said they were fearing suicide attempts. I thought I found some things where he was just becoming suicidal again, but most things I found made it seem like he was really excited about being there. Things were going really well. I think like the final background check just came in and they saw his full history. And at that point, they were like, we have to discharge you. This is fraud. You lied on an application. You received money to join the army based off that application. You're getting an, un, un, what did they call it? An uncharacterized discharge. And so this was on February 13th, 2002. So now... By August, he's going to go to NIU. He's going to start there. And he actually in the Stevenson Towers. So these are these bigger dorm rooms. They're usually for older people. And they house like three people instead of two. 
I'm sorry, they house like four people instead of two. And so he's got these three other roommates and pretty quickly they start referring to him as strange Steve. It's sad that he's, it's so easy to make up these nicknames for him, but they would talk about how he like, he didn't really want to leave the room at all unless it was absolutely necessary to like get food. He he would like shower late at night and he would go to classes. Other than that, he didn't want to leave the room. And then he would want to like, just keep talking to him about Bundy and you know, all these other serial killers and go on these big rants about Hitler. And they just didn't want to hear it anymore. And they were trying to be nice and make every excuse they could to just be like, I got a study man. And, but like, it was really just difficult for everybody in that dorm room, especially because he's again, dealing with insomnia. So he's not leaving the room and he's just not sleeping. Mm. So he was able later in the year to get put into a single room. And that was actually really good for him. He could focus a lot more on studying and he takes this sociology class and it's actually in Cole Hall, the um, room 100. And it's with this professor, Jim Thomas. And like, you can categorize this as like a life-changing event. Like he loved this class so much. He was convinced that like sociology is a way that you can really, you can look at prisons and he thinks that by doing this, you can understand America. And like, this is how he's going to be able to make a difference and He's just sort of obsessed. He starts taking additional classes with this particular professor. He's showing up to his like office hours all the time. He's even apologizing for being at the office hours. But the professor obviously loves the enthusiasm, right? He's like, please come. Like these office hours are for you. And, you know, really encourages him to focus on sociology. So, he does, and by doing this, he meets this guy, Kevin. So he's got now this good friend, Kevin, and they spend hours discussing all the same kind of stuff. And one of Steve's big focuses is Columbine, and eventually it'll be Virginia Tech, and they just come through all the details, the methodology, the choice of weapons. Steve really seemed to like admire the things that these people would do like he would talk about like Dylan and Eric and Columbine and how it was like genius that they planned to do the to have like a bomb the propane bombs blow up to cause a distraction he would just ramble on about all this stuff and at this time he's starting to make other friends too he's really building up a friend group he starts dating this girl Diana, things are going well. He's doing so well in school now that he's tutoring other kids. And he's even getting letters of recommendations for graduate school. Things are just working out for him. Is he medicated still at this time too, or no? He took himself off of medication while in the military. So yeah, it seems like he's off of medication. He's not, he's not really addressing his mental health needs at all at this point at this point he actually meets this girl jessica and she's gonna be pretty impactful in his life but this girl jessica is like she's making it known she's interested you know she's doing everything she can to get the attention of steve and he's telling her hey i have a girlfriend and she's like come on come on you know finally he kind of just caves And he breaks up with his girlfriend and him and Jessica start dating and everything's going great. They're full sociology majors. They're, you know, they're able to kind of share in a lot of this, you know, these common interests and things are going pretty well. They both graduate together in 2006. They're both planning on going back to NIU for their graduate program. He actually even gets the Dean's Award And this is a huge honor. I mean, we're talking about a guy whose third grade teacher described him as being as average as his gets to now getting this big award. He seems to be on top of the world. I would definitely say this is like the peak of his life. And then, so the relationship with his mom is just like not really there. He doesn't have a relationship with his mom. She's going through some medical things and she... I wouldn't say she would be described as like a proud mother, even during this time. And she passes away in September of 2006. So I think he 
kind of feels like he never got to mend that relationship. Maybe felt like he never got to really make her proud. So he's kind of weird about the whole situation. Like doesn't even watch Jessica coming to the funeral. Doesn't take any time off of school. Kind of shows up, says his goodbyes and leaves. And he thinks, I'm just going to go back to Northern. I'm going to math, like, this is my happy, safe space. I'm going to finish this master's program. And then all of a sudden, NIU cuts the funding for the sociology department, like gets rid of half of it. So like, everybody's like, look, you can't do your graduate's degree here. That It's not a good idea. Like just, you got to go. And his professors are even writing him and Jessica letters of recommendation to get him into the program at U of I. So I think that's one of those things where like, you just know you need to go, but it doesn't mean you want to go. Like he's really upset about this. He is, you know, he's finally kind of found his place. He's found his friends. Now he's got to leave. And him and Jessica are starting to not do so great either. The honeymoon phase is over. They're fighting constantly. They're breaking up. At one point she showed up to class crying and that like infuriated him too. I know it was an ass to you, but like, don't let other people see it kind of things. Things are getting rough, but he's hitting his five-year anniversary of being out of the mental health system. So do you guys know what you can do after being out of the mental health system for five years? No. Purchase firearms. Yeah, you can get your Ooh. firearm permit. And it's to celebrate that amazing occasion. And he bought himself a Glock 45 caliber handgun. And this is where it really starts. I mean, he's spending all of his time at the gun range. He realizes that his classes aren't going to transfer anyway. So like he just gets X in all of them. And is just only at the gun range shooting. And then on April 16th, this is when 32 people were killed in Virginia Tech. And Steve is almost like notably excited about this. I mean, he is, again, not showing up to class or anything. So he's spending all his time just like digging through this entire case and tearing it apart, talking, you know, like just almost bragging about all these great things this horrible guy did. And you know, he's talking to his friend Kevin about it a lot too. And everybody says, yeah, this probably should have been a huge red flag, but we were all sociology majors. Like we were all trying to understand why he did this and why he, you know, like why, why he was ticking the way he was, you know, it was just it, it, in the end, everyone admits it was kind of creepy how much he idolized them. So he officially moves to U of I. This is like the next month in June. And him and Jessica get a place together because he basically knows he's not going to be able just to go there on his own, right? And I think she was kind of like, look, we're friends and it's going to be cheaper if we live together anyways. So they get a place, they have separate rooms. And almost immediately, it's very apparent to both of them that he's not doing okay. Like he's really starting to fall apart. And his OCD tendencies are getting really bad. Like he has to go check the car door five times. And then he has to go check the, the apartment door three times. And it's a lot of those kind of triggers. And then he's washing his hands 20 times a day, not sleeping at all. She's begging him. She's like, you need to go get help. And they're fighting constantly because he has these extreme mood swings. So finally, she convinces him. He does go to the uh, health services. He makes an appointment. And when he goes almost immediately, he's very concerned. Like, is this going to be on my record? Uh, you know, he, he's got a lot of questions. He says he's very interested in getting some medication and he doesn't want it to cause any weight gain. And that's like all he was kind of willing to talk about. So they finally just like we're like, okay, man, like we're just going to make you an appointment with the psychiatrist. And that was booked for like three days later. So maybe it was on a whim, but Steve decides, you know, I better go out and buy some more guns real quick, just in case, just in case I end up back in that mental health system. So he trades in a bunch of his guns and he gets this Big Saucer 380. Eventually, he would go back. He would go to that psychiatrist appointment. And that psychiatrist would say, okay, we're pretty sure this is a clear-cut case of OCD. We're going to prescribe you some Prozac. And then he'd go back. It, it was working. He was still having some anxiety issues. So he goes back, and they give him Xanax as well. 
So he decides that he's actually going to get a job. He ends up getting a job as a corrections officer at the Rockville Correctional Facility in Indiana. And he just kind of stops going to class for this. He stops his job because he was a research assistant. He stops all that, but he's like, hey, it's worth it. This is what I was going to school for. I'm going to help people. Like, he's really convinced, like, this is his path. This is what he needs to do. So this is a pretty far drive for him, though. And somehow he misses his turn one day. And they're very strict. You need to be there on time or, like, it's, you know, you know, he's, like, in a probation period. Instantly fired. You kind of have to start over. So he misses his turn. He's like, shit you know and he's trying to backtrack now he's speeding and he gets pulled over so he just knows right okay I'm done I'm gonna be late I'm gonna show up late I'm gonna get fired so he's all upset he did leave this for one of his training officers that he got in close with it says I sincerely apologize for my embarrassment or shame that I may have caused by my stupid actions I may have graduated at the top of my college class, but I now understand that book smarts don't translate into common sense. In college and by many past girlfriends, I was often told that I was too smart for my own good. I now understand what was meant by that comment. So it's like he, he, you know, with all his studying of that specific subject matter that he knew what to say. And like how to say it I don't know that seemed a little scripted <laughs> yeah right I felt like it was like a way to really make everyone feel bad about the situation like you know it's, it's like back to those cops too though right that were like oh he was really remorseful I don't know I yeah it just seems like unfortunately one thing after the other like one interaction after the other was just almost a missed opportunity or but then you know that's the big picture not every none of those people knew the big picture I guess right like yeah no I get what you're saying right like if you tear each little thing apart it doesn't seem that big until you put it all together and you're like yeah he was struggling (laughs) yeah so because he is like the king of shooting himself in the foot, right? Like he's down. How can we get downer? He was still on this NIU web board. Like, I don't even think he was supposed to be on there. Like, I think it's that cool with the professor that he was like, yeah, you can stay on our sociology web board. And he finds out that this other kid on this web board is a registered sex offender. And he doesn't just call this kid out, right? He verbally assaults this guy over and over again and he will not stop to the point that everybody is freaked out how bad does it have to be that like people feel bad for the third sex offender you know like he's not the bad guy in this case and I don't I really don't know what he did to be honest so like but Steve was that bad and they had to kick him off the board and like oh he lost like most of his NIU friends at that point I think that was really big turning point for him. Now he's lost everybody. I think he had this feeling almost like I could always go back to Northern, but yeah, now you can't do that either. So to cheer himself up, because he's kind of like, you know, we can almost predict him. He goes back to some of his old behaviors and he just starts hooking up with a bunch of people. He's responding to all these people on Craigslist ads and he even puts up his own Craigslist ads as well. So another thing, like random fact about this guy is that he was super obsessed with Jigsaw from the movie Saw. Do you guys remember like the creepy clown guy? So that year for Halloween, he dressed up as him and he was like so happy. It was like me dressing up as Sookie for True Blood. Like he was like living, (laughs) it's like, this was, I've been waiting for this Halloween kind of thing. And two days later, he spends like a bunch of money and gets it tattooed on him as well. He gets this big giant jigsaw right on his forearm. That would have been just, you know, no questions asked. I know that I don't need to have you as my friend. I like, don't, I I'm like, I'm like, thank you for taking the work away. Like just cutting to the chase or I'm not, I'm good. I don't need to interact with you. I want to be not, 
I want to be far away from you. Like, I don't. <laughs> There's, I just like I'm you know I'm against horror fi- like I'm not against horror films I just don't like being scared like I've seen Saw and maybe Saw 2 but that was it like I'm not I had no desire and so if I saw someone with that face just like a visible tattoo I would be like no thank you like be on your way be like, on your <laughs> like I <laughs> it's like the equivalent very... Of an actual red flag tattoo. For yeah, you. Like, <laughs> it really is. It's, yeah, it's like you might as well just tattoo a red flag, or I don't know. That's yeah, it really is equivalent. Like, no, I don't need anything else. It's it's no thanks. Like, <laughs> I'll pass. I'll pass. Yeah. I... <laughs> I'm Ugh. not gonna lie. I mean, it didn't stop his prospects on Craigslist. So. Oh my god. Hey different strokes for different folks is that what they say yeah Um, and i'm not gonna kink shame anyone but you know not for me you know (laughs) oh Ah. (laughs) so okay so it's just kind of going through the holidays and then two days after christmas he buys a high point 380 and a 12 gauge shotgun so then on January 29th, he decides, because I'm telling you, it's like he just goes back through his checklist. You know what I should do is I should join the Navy. So he goes and he talks to this Navy recruiter and he tells him his story. God knows if he actually told him the whole story of what happened, but I'm sure he like really downplayed a lot of stuff. And the Navy recruiter's like, you know what? Like, I, I mean, you're you're going to have to take an evaluation. We're going to need you to take a psych avail. There's probably going to be a couple other, you know, hoops you got to jump through, but I think we could probably get you in the Navy. I mean, you can't be on the Prozac. You can't, you can't be on any of that medicine, but if you get off of that, we could probably sign you up for the Navy. And so Steve leaves like, yeah, awesome. Let me just go off my Prozac and I'm going to join the Navy. And so almost immediately this time like almost immediately like within days he starts getting all the same OCD tendencies back and he from February 3rd through the 5th he just starts buying up ammo all this tactical gear this did knives like he bought two more guns it's just crazy so by by February 10th He's actually trying to get Jessica to not go into work that day. He really wants her to stick around. He's supposed to be packing to like go on this little mini road trip anyways. And she's like, Hey man, I'm sorry. I got to go to work. And he's like, okay. And so she leaves and he just starts packing all of this gun, like all the guns, all the ammo, everything. And he then takes the three hour drive to DeKalb. Immediately he checks into a best Western hotel for whatever reason, 10 minutes later, he checks out. People will now speculate that it was because he used a credit card and he didn't want to be traced, but like you already checked in. I don't, I'm not really sure what you thought was going to, well, if I get out within 10 minutes, they won't make a record. He goes down the street to the travel lodge, which is, you know, a little sketchier. So they'll just take cash from him. And so then he spends the last three days pretty much in that hotel room he starts calling a lot of people saying his goodbyes he's emailing a lot of people he buys a bunch of stuff for jessica that's going to be like shipped to her after the fact including an engagement ring just a lot of weird stuff did jessica know he had bought all these guns and ammo and like was she concerned so yes and no i think that like she definitely knew he had guns she would go with him a lot of times to the gun range and stuff like i really think she just kind of wasn't putting two and two together uh which is i don't know it's kind of weird this is what she was studying i think that she wasn't as concerned i feel like he also wasn't being as open with some stuff either now like he wasn't actively being like i want to kill myself all the time so I think in her head maybe it was it really was just a hobby yeah I mean who knows how much he shared with her like and how much the extent of his history that she actually knew you know because I I don't know I don't know if like my boyfriend 
if I knew that history and if I saw him or witnessed him all of a sudden taking up that kind of hobby, I probably would have been a little concerned. But at least that's the only way I could think of is that she just didn't know everything. I don't know. the, The reason I ask is because everyone, like you were saying, when he was living in the for what the other three people and they were like just calling him strange steve like he had to have been showing some type of weird characteristic of like you're not normal something is off you know i'm sure okay this is what i'll say because and i don't want to defend him but the way i was thinking about it too is that you know sometimes i'll be in a group that's of people that are just like not into true crime and then somebody will bring <laughs> a case up that i've like covered and then i had to accidentally like blurt out all these like crazy facts and like i'll see that person in the group like just staring at me like at work or something like oh my god like she's talking about the third victim now you know what I mean and they'll be like I'm sure they're like that girl is so weird right but like then I get around my true crime people you know and they're all like you know yeah let's talk <laughs> let's get together on a Tuesday night and talk about true crime you know what I mean like so in my head I think that like he was able to sort of coast in this group a little more because I think a lot of them were kind of you know they were also spending time dissecting the minds of serial killers and stuff, like for different reasons. But maybe it was harder to like realize that right then and there. Mm. Yeah, you know? I can see that. Good point. Okay, I get it. So, but again, who knows? He So he's packing all this stuff up. He does keep making sure to like recheck his guns and everything. He wants to make sure they're loaded and everything is all set and proper. And that morning he packs up his guitar case again. He had already planned out his outfit, right? Like this is important. He has a black t-shirt that says terrorist in big white letters and a red graphic of an AK-47 assault rifle. It's a cold, overcast day. There's snow on the ground. He hops in his white Honda Civic, and he had already created his perfect playlist, and he had titled this Burn CD Final CD. The very last song was Marilyn Manson's The Last Day on Earth, and so he's literally playing that as he's pulling up to park. So he walks into Cole Hall, yeah, into room 100. He goes in the back way, actually. And at 3.04, he hops out onto the stage. And what's going on is there's an intro to ocean science class. When he bursts through the doors, he just sort of stands there for a second. And everyone's just confused. They're not even scared. They're like, what is going on? And then all of a sudden he raises a shotgun up and he starts firing it at all the students in the first row. And this is a huge lecture hall. So there's a lot of confusion. People don't know, is this a prank? Uh, Like what's going on? And so just to kind of describe it really quickly, get huge lecture hall, there's rows and rows of chairs. And then there's two big aisles so that you can get out of the place. So, I mean, if you're trying to leave through the big aisles, he's just standing there calmly, barely moving, just shooting people in the aisles. And then your only cover are these little, are these little chairs. And the instructor at the time, Joe Peterson, he's stuck on the stage with this guy. He's trying to unlock the doors. The doors are locked. He's hiding behind this little podium. And then as he's reloading. So what would happen was if he would reload, someone would yell out, people would yell out, he's reloading and people would try to get out at that point. The instructor jumps off the stage and he's going to try to run for it. But then he lands on a bunch of student bodies and he realizes that he can't run. And he, so Steve literally looks at him and like, he says there's like nothing in his face and he just shoots him. So then he just, laid there and pretended to be dead and Steve gets off the stage he's then just walking down the aisles and just like shooting people up close point blank and then at some point he 
turns around. He goes back on the stage, climbs up there, and then he shoots himself. So in the end, five students were dead and 21 people were injured. It kind of just like brings back a lot of information I remember hearing after the fact. Like, I didn't realize that many students were actually injured. I think a lot of the focus was on the body count, like the fatalities, because I knew it was very much focused on those five students. It was because that was his his space that he first heard that subject matter that he was like really passionate about. And I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I just remember like, because I was on campus when it happened and I was in, I don't know, Revis or Revis, however you want to pronounce it. Because what's crazy about that is there's a, that collection of buildings. The only way to get to that collection of buildings, there's only like a couple points, but there's like a, a circle like turnaround, like a cul-de-sac style. And the classroom I was in, the windows were facing that turnaround. And so I remember I was in class and a teacher knocks on the door. She was like, we're we're in lot like we're in lockdown there's been a shooting and i was like i remember all of us were so confused like wait seriously like what and then we just you know we didn't go through this we didn't have any drills we didn't have any practice scenarios and i remember we just went and started getting it we got as far away from the door as we could and we were just hiding behind desks and then once we realized the threat was over it was like we were looking out the window and I, it was like a front row seat of the emergency vehicles. And I saw like the body bags being brought back, like the zipped up body bags on the stretchers. And that's kind of like when it was like, oh shit, like, like what just happened? And even then it was still like, is this really happening? And it was so, it's still so surreal. Even like 15 years now, I'm like, I can't believe it's been 15 years, but it's still like, you know, I just, that, that image will like be seared into my memory for like, that's like one thing I definitely remember about that day, whereas looking out the window and seeing the black body bags being like escorted out to those vehicles. And it, it was just, yeah. And then I remember, you know, cell service was all messed up. Technology wasn't quite where it is now. My, you know, my family couldn't reach me. Friends couldn't reach me. I was, when the service was back up again, I remember, like, I couldn't even get any calls out to, like, tell people, like, I'm okay. And because it was my birthday, like, I had plans, you know, I knew that where I was going to go after class. And I just... We're, I was going to go to Mark's because they lived like so close and we had like, we're going to spend the day together. And um, I just walked straight there without even saying anything. And I just remember walking in the door and Mark was like, oh my God, Megan. And like, just hugged me right away. It was like, it was weird. And it was so like, it was like almost like we don't know what to do with ourselves. And then you start hearing things from different sources. And then I, after that, I just remember like, you know, people went home, like we all like, and it's not even just about me. Like we all had plans that day. Right. And it was just like that whole NIU community. Like we all were just going to carry on. I remember it was a Thursday, actually, I think it was a Thursday, but yeah, we we're all just going to like carry on like normal, like Valentine's day, like whatever. And then I remember going, we like, we still went to the bar last night. I felt like an asshole, but it was also still like, I don't know. It was my 21st birthday and it was, I, you know, I didn't know I, I wasn't closely attached to any of the victims or anything. And at the end of the day, I was like, you know what? Like I wasn't even, it was easy not to be selfish because it was like, I'm still here. Ideally I will get more birthdays and those five students won't. And even, I think I knew one of the kids, one of the students that were in the room, um, and he lived on the a floor in the dorm that I lived on at the time, I think. And I remember reading something 
that he reported that was like he like now he he has a hard time with the fourth of july because that like that sound that ptsd the loud yeah. booms of the firecrackers like the fireworks and um and i think like he lost his shoe like he never got his shoe back like his shoe fell off while he was running like in that classroom and that's so like messed up. like i was just like i've never talked to him about it it's just like what i read but i just remember finding out later like oh holy crap like he was he was in that classroom and even like that lasting like ptsd about it like obviously but i just remember it was like it was so traumatic for everyone and like it yeah it's like at the end of the day i was like yeah it's my 21st birthday you look forward to your 21st birthday but when something like that happens it's like it's so much bigger than you and there's this whole community because like decalb just became like this ghost town after that like that whole weekend and i think i think the campus shut down for a week after that too and um like classes resumed eventually but that's so that's so crazy because i never knew i didn't know any of that and if i like that you just went over and if i did i probably it didn't it didn't stick with me you know it was like the certain things that stuck with me where I was like, I just remember listening to voicemails from Jessica. She just spoke to me that day, like three hours. And then I get another phone call from her. She was like, I heard there's been a shooting at your school. Can you call me back? And I wish I could, because all I wanted to do is like tell people like, yeah, we're okay. Like this. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know much. Like, we're okay. I love you. But like, I couldn't even, I couldn't even do that. And it was just like, it was so crazy. But um. And, you know, think now 15 years later and I guess it's like easy to say now because like we're kind of that whole narrative, like we want to piece together, right? Like what the fuck happened? Like why would someone, what would drive someone to do something like that? But unfortunately for this kid, it seemed like, I don't know, he was either over medicated or under medicated or he was not improperly diagnosed or um, his upbringing obviously it was a little quirky it was just that like mix that formula that just wasn't quite right for any predispositions and it's so sad that like how much was ruined because of like one person and I don't it yeah it was just like messed up and like we were kind of talking about before Ashley I remember you were like we were all making plans for like that weekend and then you were like yeah I'll be your designated driver it's fine and then you texted me like later that day, like, I'm sorry, I can't. And I was just like, it, dude, it like totally fine. Cause obviously at that point I was like, it was just such a weird mood, you know, and it was like such a weird mood. And so at that point I was just like, it's, it's fine. Like, it's like, don't, don't apologize. Like, I don't even know what what's going on right now. I just remember, yeah, that weekend was a ghost town anyway. We, like I said, we went to the bar that night still just so I could like have a, a couple drinks at a bar like legally. And there was it was so empty um, for a Thursday night in a college town. It was so weird. And I just remember like even the years collecting after that, the year after we went to the memorial and stuff or like they had like some sort of like service to like memorialize the event. And even still, it was like. It took a long time to get into a place where you kind of, but then, you know, all there's so many other like similar events that happen where it's just like, like shit, man. But I don't know. And then it's, yeah, cause I'm like digging into like my memories, of, but just like the, the few things that I remember are definitely like how I felt in the classroom waiting to be let go. And seeing like those body bags being taken out and then afterwards like realizing how like just the overall mood and the overall you know the energy it was like so eerie like the energy in DeKalb and NIU campus was like it was it's like you could cut that tension with a knife it was it was so weird it was so like it was sad for sure I didn't I didn't know that you actually saw the the body bags. That's that's rough. 
Yeah, I remember we were all a, f- a handful of us were lined up looking out because those classrooms had like wall to wall windows on like that one side. Mm-hmm. And so it was pretty clear, like clear view. And it it was still I don't know. It was upsetting, but it was still like I, it was still like, is this happening? Like, like, holy shit, because, yeah, like I'd never seen anything like that before like and I think that's the closest you know besides a funeral or anything like that's the closest I've been to like you know virtually like a dead a dead body and I was just it didn't hit me until like much later where I was like realized what I was seeing because all with the only information we got in the classroom was like we're on lockdown there's been a shooting like that was the only words that we got before the teacher or whoever had told us she was like going from classroom to classroom telling everybody like we're on lockdown and we were just like so confused and it was just still that was all the information we had we didn't know where it was we didn't know in what when what building we didn't know in what classroom we didn't know if it was over how long it lasted we didn't know how many victims there were you know we didn't know we didn't know even know if it wasn't it wasn't a current student you know, it was like, we didn't know anything until much later. And so just to see that process of the emergency services, like, you know, taking action and, and, you know, almost kind of just getting like a clear view of that. It was, yeah, it it was just, it was, is that, it, yeah, like I said, like the, it just, it's just seared into my memory. Like I'm never going to forget it. For me, it was so like full disclosure, I wasn't actually going to NIU at the time. I had been going to NIU all the way up until that semester. And then I was living off campus and I realized that I could go to the Kishwaukee Community College and like still live my best NIU life, but pay like a quarter of the price. So I had, I remember like I had actually like I was coming home and I saw because I lived like right by campus and I use campus and I saw all these kids and like people sort of like running and there was just like a large group and I remember thinking like that's really weird but not thinking like too much of it and then I was like walking into my into my place and one of my roommates was running and she was like really freaked out and she was I was on a husky bus and they said that there's a shooting and I saw all these people running I think it was in Cole or DuSable and she said they, they were just announcing like to, like turn around, do not go to campus, don't drop anybody off at campus. And so then me and all of my roommates were sitting in the living room just watching the news. And like we had the same thing where you might get like a random phone call, like all of a sudden something would come through, but like trying to call people like I couldn't call my dad and say like, don't worry, I'm alive or anything. And a lot of people didn't even know I wasn't going to Northern at that point, to be honest. Like, I, you know, I didn't call the whole family and be like, yeah, guess what? I'm going to Kishwaukee Community College. So I remember we were, like sitting there and all of a sudden, cause we lived right off normal, which was like the main road to get to Kishwaukee. And I, like, I'm getting goosebumps right now. I will never forget. It was just one ambulance after another, after another, after another. And it like just kept going. And we were just sitting there and we were all just staring at each other. And we all looked so traumatized. And I will like, I will never forget that feeling of just like, it it wouldn't, and at that point there was no count, right? Like we had no idea. Uh, We had no information at all besides the fact that there was a shooting. And I remember that I then had to go to Blackstone. I was a waitress there because that was my plan. I was the only one in our group, one of the only ones who wasn't 21. So I was like, I got you, girl. I'm going to pick you up. Like, I'm going to go work a shift and then I'll pick you up after at the bar. And all like, and now all this horrible events happen. I'm getting ready. I'm like putting my apron on to go to work and all my roommates are like you're nuts we're leaving like we're packing up we're leaving and I'm like I gotta get to my waitressing job Freddie's gonna be mad if I'm late and um Megan's not there tonight it's her birthday so like I'm (laughs) 
getting ready. I'm on my way at this point. It's a couple hours after. So I remember that like, I still had to like take weird roads just to get to the other side of campus. And I remember one of my friends called me and he was really good friends with someone who had passed away. And he was like, so distraught. So like, right as I'm walking in, I'm talking to my friend who's like, just, uh, you know, very, very upset. And so I'm sitting at work for like 45 minutes and uh, just the idea, the idea of like, A, just working, B, like I'm about to have to go home to this big townhouse all by myself all weekend. And, and then like, just, I kept reliving those ambulances and like, I like literally just walked up to my boss and I was like, I got, I got to go. I have, I just, I have to go. I have to go home. And, uh, and like, I, I, I had actually, I remember I like messaged Megan first, like not that I ever thought you were going to be like, it's my birthday. You're supposed to pick me up. But I was like, it's her birthday. And this is like probably a really traumatic time. I didn't even know half your story, but I was just thinking like, you know, it's like the, the re- every time you think about your 21st birthday, right? You're going to like associate it with the shooting. So like, I wanted to make sure you were okay with it and you were, you were good with it first. And then once you were like, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> I remember like, I just like looked like a ghost and I just walked up to my boss and he was like, go. Like, I don't think he'd ever seen me like that. And I just remember, yeah, driving home and just being very... You know, I, I mean, I came, I came back that weekend later. I remember my roommates didn't come back for a while. And, you know, every time we'd hear an ambulance for a while, it was traumatic. Yeah. It's almost like you're in a movie at that point, but then you're like, wait, it was, it was for me, it was easy to not, to not be emotional about it just because I was so like, yeah, I was on campus and I saw all that firsthand but at the same time I was like well I the situation is a lot worse for a lot more people right now and so I think that's that's kind of where my head was at where it was like this isn't this isn't about me right now you know and when I do I do feel bad though because I didn't I didn't go home and I remember my parents came out to decal because I didn't go home I guess I just didn't for whatever reason, I didn't see, I didn't have, I didn't see why, but now looking back, I'm like, oh my God, my poor parents, like they probably just wanted to keep me home at that point. Or they probably, they're probably like so scared and just wanted to like see me in the flesh to make sure that every, like literally everything was that I was going to, I was fine. And I remember like my brother was like, when I was telling him what happened, I think that hit that reality hit him because I was straight up like, yeah, we were hiding behind desks. We didn't know what was going on. We didn't know anything. And he that kind of that information kind of hit him. So you just, you know, when you hear like, it's easy to kind of, you know, retell like your experience. But when I look back on it, I just remember like, yeah, like you said, like I'm so I can't help but associate this experience with my 21st birthday. But at the same time, the big picture is like, I'm, you know, I'm still here. And the year after that and the year after that and the year after that, you know, all my friends and family, they made sure to make my birthdays like awesome. And it was definitely well made up for. But yeah, it was just at the end of the day, I was just like, I'm this time is much worse for a lot more people fuck my 21st birthday we did talk about steve a lot obviously so i did just want to take a second and go over specifically the five victims that unfortunately lost their lives we have catalina garcia she was 20 and she was a sophomore she was majoring in elementary education and she was from cicero so she was very active in the latino resource center And she just always had a smile on her face and she was known for being optimistic and her older brother would actually talk about like how much she loved pink and would refer to her as the family's pink princess. Uh, Daniel Parmenter was 20 and he was focusing on finance. That was his major. He was a sophomore and his story always like, kind of especially broke my heart too, because he wasn't even supposed to be in class that day. 
it was his girlfriend's class, but it was Valentine's Day. So he wanted to go there and, you know, be there with her. And she did end up getting shot as well. So while she was in the ICU, she she did thankfully survive. She said that Dan held her hand and began praying for them before he was shot. So, yeah, I mean, he was the social chairman for the Pi Kappa, sorry, for the Pi Kappa Alpha fraternity. And so they were better known as the Pikes. And like I said, I have a, I had friends that were in that frat and they were all devastated. I mean, the stories they were telling about him too, he just seemed like such an amazing guy. And, you know, not just like really funny and, you know, nice and things like he was really intelligent too. And he was known to really be a gentle giant. So definitely, again, another, another big loss there. Then there was Gail Dubowski and she was 20. She's a sophomore. She had just declared her major a month previously. She decided she wanted to focus on anthropology. Her family was longtime members of the Chicago Church of Christ, which they had, they actually had a campus charter in DeKalb. So that was part of the reason she chose to go there. And <clears throat> The thing that really stuck out to me about Gail was how many instructors had so many wonderful stories to tell about her. I mean, she really left her mark on the classroom. And I was just really impressed by that because like as a sophomore, like I don't think that any of my teachers could have pulled an actual story about me, you know? Then there's Juliana Gihant. She was 32. She uh, she was there. She was a junior. She was doing elementary education, but she had already logged 12 years in the U.S. Army and the Army Reserves. She was a uh, sergeant first class in an engineering unit, and she'd even done a tour in Bosnia. And then this is how she's taken out. And then we have Ryan Mace. She was a 19 year old sophomore. She was an honor student studying psychology and she really intended on obtaining her doctorate level degree and she wanted to work in counseling. You know, she was all about the day she was supposed to celebrate Valentine's Day with her roommate that day. And the very last thing that she posted on MySpace was happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Saying you love someone is not enough. It's how you treat them that shows your true feelings. I think it's it's really tragic and, you know, I don't know what else I could say. That I think it's just really hard. But one thing I will say actually though is, do you remember at the time there was a lot of controversy around people saying that there was six victims? Because do you remember this? And they had like tried to put out six crosses because it was yeah. coming out very early that he suffered from mental illness. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I remember, I think they're like one of the crosses was even like vandalized a couple of times. Yeah. I think after going through all of this and now it just being 15 years later, I probably have like a slightly different perspective, but I remember being mad at the time. I remember not wanting to see that six cross there. Yeah. Cause it does come off as like disrespectful to the families. Like, why are you going to place that like equate that life with my child he was the one who took my child away what are you know I could kind of see that I remember being like what were they thinking like why and yeah. even, I don't know even looking back I don't know I still think it was poorly executed who who was the one that made the decision to put out a six cross in memory of him was it the school or i don't know i yeah because it was on campus right i just that they, they had on, that yeah they were like the white crosses on campus i don't remember if that was i don't think that was officially put there by niu or i don't know but there even in the news and stuff there was sort of this narrative of should we say five or six victims and how uh, I mean oh. it's like I mean I, I feel this way and I, it wasn't my daughter or my son you know what I mean like I just couldn't imagine 
maybe it's like not the time to bring up the you know that side of the argument right then and there yeah like i don't you know because why do you put a cross up like in remembrance right because there's some sort of like affection or just there's a certain mood that you feel towards those victims and it's like well he he doesn't fit that that pocket he doesn't fit that you know that emotion so i don't know you know how do you both feel now so ashley you, you said then you were angry but has your perspective changed now um i think no like i still don't think that the cross should be there honestly i think definitely maybe you know have a you know a discussion around mental health and and things along those lines but like overall i definitely don't think that that was executed properly i think that at the time i we were also confused too like why did he drive from u of i to northern so i do think that makes a little more sense to me now and i think maybe there were still people at northern who cared about him so maybe that's why there was a little more of a fight for this cross yeah Did maybe that's they felt like he was still he was at one time a part of the community i don't know after all of this happened was he portrayed in the media as a victim or was he portrayed as a you know a monster i don't know if i remember i remember just getting information here and there um but i think maybe at the time i just thought oh they're focusing on on the criminal they're focusing on him like they're because they, that's what that's what we see like in the media is they're glorifying the individuals who do these who commit these actions um because that's it's like our, our our morbid curiosity about it too right like what was talking wrong to with two him? women who yeah yeah like talking to two women who do a true crime podcast like you know there is that curiosity and that trying to trying to explain it trying to figure out like why you know or what makes this what drives a person to do this and i get that part of it um but that's like the only i think that's one just one of the few things i remember in the media because at at on campus it was very much all about the five of them who lost their lives from what i remember yeah i think it was uh also just talking about the news i think it was just sort of a, a slightly different time i mean not everybody was on social media it's not like now following the idaho floor on tiktok or something you know i think it was even going back the narrative was like there wasn't much it was like he had mental illness he had suffered with this for a while and then it was kind of turned towards the five victims and another thing that I'm always surprised is like how many people even around here are like what are you talking about there was a shooting at NIU like there was a mass shooting and it's <clears throat> it's horrible to say but like the fact that the body count is I don't want to say only five but when you look at some of the other horrible school shootings that happened right around then, it's just like kind of almost an afterthought unless you went to NIU or, you know, you catch the news on the on February 14th, maybe. Yeah, I think I remember that too. That was what surprised me because you, because you hear about it or like you hear a recap, sad to use that for lack of better words, but of like the instances of shootings mass shootings that have happened and yeah i don't hear about niu i remember wait but an, a shooting happened at niu where why are they not on the list of the collective um incidents over this period of time and i'm but uh, yeah it's it's because there were five casualties and not you know 20 and like that's I don't know it from what I remember yeah I remember thinking that where it was like yeah why isn't why why isn't this amongst the list is it you know and it, like now of course like 
you understand, you know, we get it why, but it's still like does a, it's a disservice to the very real impact that it had on the NIU and DeKalb community and then like those families and even close friends, like people who, you know, who were close friends with the victims or again, we're waiting, we're waiting for a phone call that never came or we're trying to reach that person, the phone that never got picked up. You know, it's like, it goes so much deeper than that. And, you know, unfortunately the bigger picture, it's just, it's a, it's the, the sensationalism of it or lack thereof. I don't know. Yeah, it was challenging doing research because I found that I had to read like a lot of the NIU reports and things like that. There's no Netflix documentary on this, right? Like the only thing that I can really call out is David Vaughn. He's wrote, he actually wrote the book, The Last Day on Earth. So he wrote The Last Day on Earth and it's a whole book about the case and about Stephen. And then he did like an Esquire article that I highly recommend if you guys want to uh, learn more about, check check that out. But yeah, other than that, it's not, you know, you're going to find 20 books on Audible on this case. I appreciate you both sharing your experience and, and how it's impacted you and um i i mean it's just i was speechless i i couldn't even i didn't even have words after you guys both shared like what you remembered how it happened and everything and what you saw so thank you both for sharing no thanks for the opportunity i think this is like one of the first and oh yeah i can't remember if there was any other time that i shared you know specifically those images or from like the dated the moment to moment that I remember there's that class of people the group of people that I was in that class with it was actually the track to for the teacher certi- certification for English and so that class that was like one of the first classes we took in that track where you take all those classes together over like those four semesters and so we definitely bonded in that situation and and you know, we call it, we call it, there's like this 15 or 16 of us. We call each other our forever Valentines. Cause that was just an un unprecedented, like bonding moment. I mean, obviously you want to have other opportunities to bond with that group of people who you're going, you know, through these, this certain course track and education track with every semester after that every class after that it was just it just really cemented that bond and even though it's been 15 years and um I'm I've remained close with one of them maybe two three more it's it's still like we'll always remember that that moment we'll always remember how we feel for each other and with each other it's you know we're always going to remember that so you know shout out to NIU English T-cert class of 2009. Love you all. You know, just, oh, I'm always thinking about you guys every year. <laughs> I'll ge- leave you guys with one last thing that I just couldn't get out of my mind with this case. And the cops went and talked to Susan, who is Steven's sister, his slightly older sister. And she said that she was really surprised that he didn't come and kill her first. That just kind of gives you a little glimpse into, you know, what the people who really knew him and and his family maybe felt or, or feared about him. I think, you know, maybe there were a few more red flags and I wish people had taken him seriously. And unfortunately it's, you know, it's really sad that it's the 15th anniversary for those five people that lost their lives. Thank you again, Megan, for coming and sharing your story. And thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. You know, please leave us five stars, follow us on social media and check Megan out on the Nerd Cantina, especially her episodes, the Cantina Conversation. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me.